Hi, everyone, and welcome to Wholesale Change, the webcast and podcast from Distribution Strategy Group, where we provide thought leadership for wholesale change agents like you, because if you're a wholesale change agent, you are in the right place. My name is Ian Heller. I'll be your co-host today. I'm with Distribution Strategy Group. I'm delighted to introduce my partner, the doctor of distribution, who hates being called Dr. Bein, so I call him Dr. Beinstein. Jonathan Bein, PhD. How are you today, Jonathan? Always happy to be with you, Ian. This is a great topic. We have a lot of people in, so we want to remind you to please submit your questions. If you remember, we prefer the Q&A button just because it's easier for us to keep track than the chat button, but we will try to get to all of them. We have a couple of great guests today, so now let me introduce them. They are... Oops, wait, first, sorry, guys, I got to do the sponsor read through. We're not going to have any funding to continue to do this show. <laughs> so uh, how about I do Epicurean, you do Zillion today, Jonathan? Does that make sense? Sounds great. Great. Okay. So we've got two sponsors. Uh, uh, I'll talk about Epicor because for nearly 50 years, Epicor has helped distributors stay ahead with flexible, powerful solutions designed to increase sales. We all want that. Streamline operations and improve customer experience. Epicor's industry-leading ERP solutions are built specifically to meet the unique needs of wholesalers with everything needed to grow your sales, profits, and productivity while distancing yourself from your competition. Epicor is focused on the things that matter to you. Work queues, PO variance queues, kitting, assembly and production orders, advanced inventory forecasting, VMI, and special project pricing. They build their software using industry best practices and 50 years of distribution experience that's even more than I have. But Epicor's solutions are far more than just tools for pick, pack, and ship. Fully cloud-based with a modern UI, Epicor offers complete, robust e-commerce solutions, powerful BI and analytics tools, modern API and EDI, value-added services, WMS, virtual assistants, and much more. You can learn more about how Epicor helps thousands of wholesalers succeed <clears throat> by visiting epicor.com. Jonathan, over to you. Our other sponsor is Zilliant. And Zilliant is a leader in the pricing and analytics space. Are you confident that your commercial teams can make the right calls when revenue and margin are on the line? Zilliant, the industry leader in intelligent B2B price optimization, price management, and sales guidance software helps distributors do so and power intelligent commerce. Zillion's cloud-native price optimization, price management, deal management, and predictive sales software helps distributors use their data more intelligently to deploy commercial strategies in all go-to-market channels. In fact, they were recently named a leader in the IDC marketscape. Think upper right quadrant, worldwide B2B price optimization and management applications 2021 vendor assessment. That's a really significant honor that they were given, which provides an overview of the latest price optimization trends and advice for companies considering price optimization solution, solutions. Zillion has decades, maybe even more than 50 years. No, it's I don't know. Less than 50 years. <laughs> it's less than 50 years. But it's decades of experience building, de deploying highly scalable, flexible data science-driven pricing and sales solutions for diverse B2B industries like manufacturing, distribution, commodity businesses, rental business services, and beyond. To find out more, please visit www.zillion.com or let us know and we can connect you to the Zillion team. That's great. So we are covered from E to Z. Happy to Zillion today. Thanks so much for our sponsors. As I said, we only have a show because of them. So now let me introduce our guests. We have Bruce Strawn and Helgi Lea. Bruce is with Argon and Company. Helgi is with Distribution Performance Solutions. I know you guys work together a lot. I hope I didn't butcher your names. If I did, please correct me immediately. Bruce, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Maybe go through your background and your uh, current responsibilities? Sure. Love to. Thank you, uh, Ian and Jonathan. Um, yeah, my, my background in the last... Um, 30 years has been in consulting. So I've been in supply chain consulting and operations in many different areas. I'm currently the uh, managing partner of the Atlanta office of Argon and Co. Um, and we're a, a global management consulting firm. So this topic is near and dear to our heart. Um, certainly the issues and opportunities associated with this are kind of what what we thrive on from a business standpoint. So I appreciate the opportunity today and look forward to talking to everyone. You bet. And I see you've got kind of a slacker of an educational background, uh, Georgia Tech, you know, master's in industrial systems and engineering, Rochester Institute of Technology, 
a bachelor's in the same thing, man, that's quite impressive. So you've been doing mostly like supply chain, uh, warehouse automation, this kind of work for a long time now, right? Your whole career. Yes. That's been kind of what I've done. I started out, uh, actually working in a, a automotive assembly plant, decided that wasn't really where I wanted to be for the rest of my career. So hmm. I headed down to um, Atlanta and have been here ever since and, and learned all the things I could from Georgia Tech. Um, so it's, it's really been something I've been doing and playing with for a long time. Fantastic. Well, thank you for joining us today. Helgi, welcome to the show. Why don't you tell thank us a little you. bit about your responsibilities and background? Uh, quick history in the background. Um, I went to Clemson University in South Carolina, graduated in 1992, moved to Atlanta. Uh, as you might recall, there was a recession in 92. Uh, so I was able to join a supply chain distribution firm uh, called PYA Monarch, which is a food distributor. And I worked my way up through that company, uh, moved a lot into the warehousing side, doing labor management implementation, et cetera. Um, and then after having multiple third shift type of career uh, job opportunities, decided to, to educate a little bit further. I uh, went to Georgia State for my master's. Uh, after that, worked for UPS Supply Chain Solutions, which is the 3PL arm of UPS, um, and then started working at Fortna. And Fortna is a well-known, well-respected uh, distribution services integrator. Uh, and then my boss from there uh, moved companies to DPS, Distribution Performance, recruited me, and we've been doing great things for great clients the last four or five years. Yeah, you know, I tell you, any company that has three words beginning with with distribution in their name, distribution yes. performance solutions, distribution strategy group, obviously, great companies. Yes, obviously, the preeminent companies in the in the space. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, Jen. So I thought maybe the way we would start out, and as you guys know, and as our audience mostly knows, we don't do a lot of rehearsal. This isn't a presentation. We're going to stop sharing. We're just going to talk. Um, so. You know, let's talk about what are the primary issues we're hearing about from, you know, from, I know you guys work not just with distributors, but upstream and also with manufacturers, et cetera. Uh, and so you have, I'm sure have a lot of experience with shipping and logistics and transportation that we don't, we, we, re, but this show is really focused on distributors. So I thought maybe the four of us could talk about, well, what are the issues that we're hearing? First of all, what are the problems that people are struggling with? Then maybe sort of get behind what's causing this. Then talk about what are things that distributors can do about it. And finally, you know, when is it going to end? So, uh, you know, I don't know who wants to start, but what are you hearing from distributors in particular about what supply chain frustrations they're facing today? Yeah, you know, I'll start and then I'll let Bruce chime in as well. Um, so the interesting thing for me and for our firm is the questions that we're hearing from our clients are changing. Uh, and, and one of the jokes or not jokes, but the comment I share often is pre-COVID, we would get a lot of questions around, hey, how do we improve some things in our facility? How do we dis distribute better? How, we, how can we be more efficient? How can we handle omni-channel e-commerce, et cetera? Since the COVID and the inbound uh, issues that we're having around supply chain, uh, the questions have really changed from how do we do a little bit better to how do we get people out fully? How do we automate fully? Um, a quick example, we have done more robotics related projects in the last two years than my previous 18 years combined. Mm -hmm. um, this to show you how the, the questions are being asked differently uh, and the solutions are now different. Uh, and of course, the results, you know, in the future will obviously be a little bit different as well. Um, the questions I hear are most often around what's causing, as you said, Ian, the inbound issues. And it's really a perfect storm. And there's a host of things that we can dig into. Uh, the other question I always get is, when will this be over? Which was mm -hmm. your question as well. Um, and then within the facility, there are a lot of questions, obviously, with labor pressure, wage increase pressures, uh, the Amazon effect on a lot of distributors. Um, so we'll talk through that in greater detail, but, but we're hearing a host of questions uh, and they're changing uh, and some are more strategic and some are more tactical, but predominantly very strategic. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. And, uh, and let, I want to start with sort of the, the problems you're hearing. Bruce, what are you hearing from distributors? Well, I think the, the things that, that we're hearing are the same things everybody's hearing. It's about the transportation delays the cost of ocean transport going up, you know, fivefold. Uh, uh, certainly, the I think the other side of it. I mean, we're hearing a lot of problems. We're also hearing a lot of um, expectation changes from from our customers. So, uh, and and I kind of put all that together. It's not all bad. I think we're going to come out of this stronger. I think the companies that have been dealing with this. It's, it's kind of survival of the fittest. So you kind of deal with it, you learn how to do it better. 
Um, and then you come out of it with kind of some more hardened ideas about how we do it. But the, you know, I don't think we're distributors are hearing anything truly different than than everybody else. So uh, question, questions that we get asked are partly sometimes it's how do you put out the fire? And certainly that when we were doing work um, in, 20, in the second quarter of 2020, it was about that. It was about the fires that were that were um, out of control and trying to figure out just how to get things in the door and out the door. I think as time has gone on, the questions are getting more, okay, this has gone on for a while. It's not over yet. It's going to be a while. Now, how do we change what we have to do in the future? Because I don't think anybody should assume, um, <clears throat> you know, we always hear about the new normal. Nobody knows what that really looks like, but it's not going to be what it used to be. So I think distributors as well as manufacturers and transportation companies and even customers themselves need to change their expectation of what this thing's gonna be about. Um, I mean, if we could forecast a year ahead, that'd be great, but we're being asked to kind of deal with things. What do we, what do we try to, how do we try to build the next five years? Mm -hmm. um, so it, it always starts with what data point do we start with as our baseline? And it's not gonna be, what we did in September of 2020. Yeah, let me tell you what what sort of the what I've been hearing, and I'm going to try to summarize the problem sort of end to end. Um, I have the honor of uh, hosting a, a call with an ITR economics economist every month uh, or every six weeks uh, for the Association Education Alliance, and uh, so I handle a lot of questions and I see the presentations, and I've been doing this for a while now. And and here's my summary of what happened. Okay, so uh, COVID hit. Uh, a lot of industrial companies, distributors, manufacturers, et cetera, assumed we were going to have an extended recession. And so they uh, planned for less demand from the end consumer, whether it's a business or a retail customer, all the way through to the factory. So the industrial companies canceled a lot of their orders for all kinds of products, everything from plastics uh, to electronic components, especially semiconductors. So this was in the you know, sort of the end of the first quarter of 2020 as the, as COVID took and there was a lot of fear in the marketplace. And so these, you know, manufacturers across the board just slashed their orders for all kinds of products, including electronic components. What happened is the economy didn't slow down, but it changed a lot. And suddenly millions and millions of people began working from home. And that created this explosion of demand for electronic components because people were buying laptops and modems and keyboards and mice and monitors. And so the demand that would have been allocated to industrial manufacturers or you know people manufacturing cars and the capital equipment, et cetera, got sucked up into this consumer electronics channel. Well, then the economy didn't slow down. And so all these other companies that make products, and as you know, if you plug it in, it's got some electronic components in it these days, right? even light bulbs, right? You can get Wi-Fi light bulbs. Yeah. Suddenly everybody began, all the industrial people went back and placed their orders again, but they were now behind these consumer product orders. So they were already, you know, way behind in terms of priority. And then all those companies went an allocation. And by the way, the companies that manufactured all that stuff had slashed their production plans or delayed their production plans by months. So new you know, they would have, they were going to be behind anyway, because it takes a long time to stand up a fab, but now they're, you know, six months behind where they were. And you have this new demand that nobody anticipated for all this electronic stuff. Right. And so that was sort of the start of the delays. Okay. Then you had a bunch of other delays, right? So the plastics manufacturers began to run short because suddenly plastics for, you know, shields and face masks and partitions at customer service places and airports, that stuff all got sucked out of the channel. Right. So, uh, then you had these, you know, once a century blizzards in Texas that shut down a bunch of refineries for weeks, right? Well, you know, petroleum is the raw good that they make plastics out of. So now you not only had a semiconductor shortage, you had a plastics shortage, right? Next thing that happens is China decides to export much less of its production and keep, keep much of it for their own production, right? And so now there's a shortage of materials coming out of China, right? Uh, then you have suddenly a huge labor shortage, which people can blame on a number of things. 
you know, government incentives uh, causing people not to want to work full time or at all, maybe who knows, but you have this big labor shortage, right? And so you, 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 you so, so the fact that the economy didn't really turn into a recession caused all these problems. Now, I think the other thing that's happening, and I remember when I was a Granger a million years ago, we used to play something called the beer game. And you'd try to, you know, uh, order, you were running a liquor store and you try to order beer and you, you would run out. And so you'd order more. And what happens is you get this boomerang effect where suddenly people way over order and you get hoarding, you know, just like you saw, you know, toilet paper and hand sanitizer uh, being hoarded. You know, the same thing happens in the industrial world. So everybody's uh, ordering a lot more than they need. Right. And so the, the demand or the orders are way above real demand now. Um, and so, and, and by the way, that's going to catch up with us later and we're going to have huge gluts of all kinds of products when this is over at the time. And so, you know, sort of that, and I'm probably leaving something out, but now, you know, labor rates are going up and you can't hire anybody to drive trucks or, or, you know, work on docks to unload ships or work in warehouses. Okay. So attrition uh, is high. Attrition is high. Uh, uh, you have a bunch of inflation that's hard to predict. It's really hard for distributors to manage their cost increases through to their price increases to their customers, right? So, so these operational challenges have just gotten really, really tough. So, am I leaving anything out? I mean, that's or am I wrong? I mean, that's the scenario as I understand sort of how we got to where we are. Yeah, you know, I'd say you were hit at 100, you know, right on the right down the center. Um, a couple of things maybe prior to COVID. Um, there was a lot of conversations, as many of you recall, around tariffs on Chinese imports. That created a level of stress and relationship issues. Um, and then, of course, when COVID did hit, it, it was hitting different parts of the world at different times. So, for example, right now, we in the West, we're pretty much open. However, in many Asian countries where they're still manufacturing a lot of product, they're still very much closed, <coughs> um, which creates additional issues. Um, so, so I think, Ian, I think you had everything on the head. Um, and I think there was probably starting to be a crack in the supply chain before COVID. And then COVID, of course, exacerbated the whole issue. Um, and then we have the host of other things that have, that have jumped on board. Um, one comment that was interesting is a lot of our clients uh, and the term lean distribution, lean manufacturing has been really the, the mantra of many companies and many strategies uh, along the way. There is a theory right now that lean is a disaster. <laughs> Uh, because as of right now, because of the leanness of supply chains, uh, the ability to, to react and to adapt was, was basically restricted, um, especially if you have one component out of, let's say, Thailand, that, and you can't do anything else. You, know, you might have your 99 other components, but your one component you definitely need. Um, and so you're, so you're, you're as good as your weakest link. You're as good as your weakest link. And yeah. right now, we have a lot of weak links. Yeah. So, I mean, the whole, one of the premises of lean is that you remove buffer inventory. Without a doubt, yeah. Right. So, and, and then, as you said, Ian, we're going to create a glut because I've already had some of our manufacturing partners say, "Hey, we have to buy now. We have to place purchase orders now because stuff is taking 36 weeks that used to take eight. And so they're asking us, "What are we projecting from a project perspective?" And of course, we all have pipelines, and so we're saying these are the things we're projecting. They're going ahead and buying things. Uh, you know, they're buying IO blocks, they're buying uh, wiring, they're buying, you know, all kinds of things ahead. And like you said, I think it's going to create a glut soon, not, maybe not soon, but probably within the next year, we're going to have so much supply and not enough demand. And then the whole equilibrium will shift. It may not be a year, maybe two. Um, but I definitely I think also if you, if you turn back the clock or calendar a little even more, um, you know, an awful lot of what we're dealing with happened in the last 30 years where people were, were outsourcing their products to um, faraway countries and people were talking about the huge pipeline we had. So people then got on top of that and they got it to be kind of humming along where eight weeks didn't seem that long and it isn't until you lose the eight weeks and you've got to try to make it up. So I think the whole emphasis on low cost labor markets to make our products um, really got shown um, some of the challenges and risks associated with that. I don't think we're gonna go back to the idea where, every, where the things we consume are in the next county. But on the other hand, I think there will be some products that, that will come back and, and we saw the, the huge risk of, of having it that far away in a demand that's not stable. And not under your control, ultimately. And right? not under, yeah. yes. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, you know, if, if uh, it, there, there's, there's a, a, 
greater than small chance will be in some kind of you know aggressive conflict with China at some point in time. And if they, for example, shut off shipments of electronic components both from China and from Taiwan, uh, you know, we frankly have to make a lot of that stuff here if we're going to be a competitive and secure. Uh, world leading country in the future, right? So yeah. I think, you know, obviously, that's, that's a longer term thing. But, you know, in, in the short term, I do think there's this cautionary note here for distributors that there's going to be a glut and, and, and you have a, uh, th there's a chance you could get stuck with a whole bunch of dead inventory for a long time, if you're overly aggressive, mm -hmm. if you're not careful, right? But, yeah. But, but right now, you know, we've got a lot of distributors who historically have had availability and service levels in the high 90s who are now in the mid to low 80s. Is, is that what you guys are seeing, Bruce and Helgi? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, even if that. Uh, yeah. I mean, we've seen people down in the uh, uh, 60s and 70s. I just looked at a chart last week from a, a beverage company um, that a lot of their products were imported and and they were they were up in the high 90s first quarter last year and the drop is just so significant not because of the transportation pieces but simply the supply function when when went away i mean you, you no longer could could feed the beast and when you can't do that and everybody wants it it's really hard to build the stability back up where fill rates are where they ought to be so, so uh, what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about what we see and hear distributors are doing to address some of this. And I've got some of my own views, but I'd like to, Jonathan, I'm going to start with you in a second to talk about what you're hearing. Um, but I also want to ask our audience to submit questions and submit ideas. We will not today use your first or last name. Fair enough. We'll just say somebody has asked or somebody has suggested. So you can do this with complete anonymity, but we would love to hear your suggestions or your questions uh, about what distributors are doing to address these problems. Jonathan, do you want to start? Well, actually, we have a question right off the bat. Somebody Great. somebody responded to your request again. Uh, hello, gentlemen. I've read two conflicting articles this week about fasteners. One report said there was a supply chain shortage, and one said that Fastenal had experienced growth. Is Fastenal an anomalous case, or do you think there is skewed data in the reporting? That's, that's such a great question, Jonathan. I have not read those specific reports. Uh, I did read about Fastenal's last quarter and they exceeded expectations from a financial perspective. Um, and they are obviously the number one distributor of fasteners I and mean, it's hence their name. Um, but I'll have to look at those reports to see what the data is being pulled from. I, I have as well heard conflicting information. Uh, you know, if you read enough in supply chain, uh, you're gonna hear some conflicts just like any industry. Um, so um, I'd have to actually see those those documents and read them and, and understand kind of what, what created those results or those different answers. Um, but it does not surprise me that there would uh, not be enough inventory uh, because as you shared earlier, you know, 70% performance versus 99. Um, I was at a client recently last week actually, and they didn't have 25% of their inventory because they couldn't get it basically into their building. Um, so their service level minimally drops from 99 down to 75 because they don't have inventory to fulfill their orders. I would think that's analogous to fasteners as well. Um, there, my, my gut feeling is the one report that talks about there being um, a dearth or lack of fasteners available seems to me right now to be the more, I'd say more prevalent thought. Um, however, that doesn't mean a company like Fastenal can't do very well. Uh, there are a lot of things they're selling more PPE, they're selling more safety products. Um, so you know, it may not tie directly to the quality or success of a company you know, because they're shifting. Bruce, your thoughts? I'm just second there. I better plug my computer in or I won't have any <laughs> thoughts. I'll have them, but not be able to share them. Yeah. Um, well, I think, I think part of the issue here is we're dealing with maybe an increase in demand, but not across the same um, uh, customers as where it was last year. So if you're sitting there and you should have 100 to fulfill your demand and you only have 70, uh, if you're a small player, uh, you may have greater difficulties of getting what you need than if you're the number one consumer of those, those products. So I, I'd say that's always in play. 
in an allocated inventory market. Uh, but I think the other th thing is just that uh, the user market, it, the demand has gone up because there are more people that are needing fasteners. And so there are people that are making things that um, at a higher rate. And so the consumption has gone up. Um, that means everybody might be might be short. So that would be, I guess, what I would explain, probably explain the, that those two different reports depends on which side of the fence you're on. So, so I want to jump in real quickly on Fastenal because I did listen to their earnings call, uh, and I suggest you do the same. So remember, they have low turns, right? I think it's like two point three or something like that, and they have three thousand locations, and so they have much more months worth of inventory on hand just as a part of their strategy. It's a high margin, low turn model. Uh, so if you read their earnings transcript or, or listen to the call, they, they talk about how well we were just in a better position because we had more months of supply on hand. Um, and then they also have tried to turn to some domestic manufacturers to replace some of their import goods. But I, I think it was mostly just a result of, you know, they, they, if you're a very low turn, high margin model, that ain't lean, right? And that's not, they're not trying to be, that's not their strategy. And so I think they were just in a, in a different position uh, in some ways that just worked to their advantage. Yeah. Well, and all that being said, by the way, their, their market cap just keeps growing and their revenue keeps growing. So they, they clearly are managing through this very well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have another question. What's the thought on how the Biden administration will decide regarding section 301 tariffs? Or to you on that one, Bruce? Uh, I'm not sure I've got a, a good answer on that. I, I don't think we've really seen exactly how that's gonna fall out. And that's not an area I'm an expert on, so I probably won't even try, or, or it might sound political. So I'll tell you that the uh, economist that I hosted the call for recently was asked that question, and I, I don't want to be 100% confident that I'm giving her answer as she stated it, but I believe what she said is they're not expecting a change in those tariffs anytime uh, soon. Um, mm. So the, they, they, they think that would have already happened, but uh, you know, I guess we'll see, right? Uh, Jonathan, to your to your point, though, and I know Bruce didn't want to get political and neither do I, I am hearing a lot about the infrastructure plan and the impact that could have on steel. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a lot of uh, we're hearing about forward buys from companies like Amazon and Walmart in the steel market. Uh, we're hearing about supply being you know basically kept to the side for government use. Um, so that infrastructure plan, depending on the size and what's actually in it at the end of the day, could create an additional stress on on steel. Uh, well, what, yeah, the, the, yeah, the biggest version of that will go back to creating an effect on chips, right? Yes, yes, that happens. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. We got another question: Should we continue to expect eventual retroactive rebates pushed backward throughout the supply chain? I would have to answer yes. Uh, we're seeing so much push backwards. Uh, you know, if, I'll, I'll share an example. We have probably three projects going on right now. And all three have been impacted by either the chips or the steel. And the clients have commitments to delivery and success. And their questions now are coming back in the reverse of, hey, it's costing us more to do what we're supposed to do because everything is delayed, right? So if that pushback is happening on, you know, from a distributor to a manufacturer to an integrator side, it's definitely gonna happen with the product side as well. I, I would think that would be, um, you know, everyone wants to uh, achieve their quickest revenue and delay their costs as much as possible. And I think that is going to continue, Jonathan. That's, that's my perspective. Good. Um, Bruce, do you have a thoughts on that or do you want to, should we go to the next question? Let's go to the next question. Okay, the next question is how does a distributor overcome huge capitalized increases in shipping costs to get products from the manufacturer, specifically paying for overseas air freight versus waiting for ocean freight? Yeah. Well, air freight, I think is about 20 X ocean. Um, you know, from a standpoint of cost. So the last thing you want to do if you're trying to minimize your transportation costs is air freight and anything. Now we understand the reality is, hey, we need product today because we have to fulfill a certain demand. And so people are incurring that cost. The only, not only, one of the most effective ways, and I think Bruce hit on, I think Ian, you and Jonathan hit on as well, is the approach to near shoring some of these items that are considered critical that are now abroad. So we think about how complex the global supply chain is. We're trying to meet a demand for, the, let's just say that customer, I'm just gonna say a demand in New York City, but the product that is fulfilling that demand could be in five different countries. Uh, so the complexity of getting all five of those things to that person in New York City 
is probably pushing them to use air freight. Um, I do think distributors are going to have to uh, requ require maybe too strong a term, but um, influence their manufacturers to have more localized, regionalized manufacturing. Um, because as we see, the supply chain has a couple weak links, and I think this has been exposed as one of them. Um, so to answer his question, I think a push on their manufacturers to nearshore more, manufacture more regionally or more domestically. And that could be Canada, United States, Mexico, because that's an easier transport than coming across the ocean. Um, but the cost, unfortunately, right now, they're exorbitant. Um, I read recently that Walmart is paying drivers $88,000, which is twice the median salary for truck drivers today, uh, because oh. they're, trying to, they're trying to get their people. So you can imagine that cost is going to be passed on to you as a distributor. Um, so I, I think it's just, unfortunately, the supply and demand econ 101 kind of issue, um, where the demand is much higher than supply. And it's unfortunately causing that, that whoever asked that question, uh, causing some of those things today. Now, obviously, we hope within a year or two that starts to level off and it becomes more normal or more normalized. Um, but I think right now it's just one of those things. If you have to get it there, you're spending that air freight number and that air freight number is 20 X, you know, versus comparing across the sea. So um, so there's some nuances there. It's not an easy answer. Where, where do you think the ratio will be as we get back to a more normal time? It's always been more expensive. I've always read, I think like 8X. It was, okay. was about 8X and I think now it's 20. Um, and that includes, keep in mind, the, the ships themselves have also increased dramatically. Um, the US, the China to the West Coast in the US has gone up 200% since May. You know, so the, you, take in a, you compound the shipping wow. cost just via, via container is X amount. And then the air freight is, is you know, 20X that number. Is um, that a... Is that a, 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 a a ship shortage, a, 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 a container shortage, a labor shortage, all of the above that's driving that? Or just think, they, they can charge that because the market will bear it? Yeah, I think all of the above, Ian. I think the other thing that, that, um, that I read recently that was very interesting is when we had the pandemic and we were pushing PPE from China to basically everywhere across the globe, we pushed containers to Africa, for instance, hundreds and thousands of containers to different parts that aren't really, an, a, um, what's the word I want to use? A revenue generating route. Um, so I've read that they actually have containers, but they're in locations that aren't really conducive to kind of the, you know, the, as we call it, the milk run and supply chain, you know, you go into one spot and coming back. So they have to deadhead uh, them back because there's nothing exporting out of there. Exactly. Exactly. And right. then secondly, they're starting to build bigger ships. Uh, they're trying to get to 20,000 containers per ship. So the bigger ship you build, that means you have more product on that ship. That means the ports in the U S have to, you know, they have to be deeper. They have to have the infrastructure to support that. Um, to unload a 20,000 container versus the normal was eight to 12,000 is obviously two and a half X longer. Mm -hmm. um, so if your product happens to be on that container, that's on the bottom of that load, you know, you're, you're stuck for a while. Um, so I think there's a, a, it's a whole bunch of things, Ian. I think you hit them all. I think there's the, the right supply and the right location of containers is an issue. Uh, the changing of ship size to make it bigger, which means there's more volume coming through. And they're saying they're building to like 2023, mm -hmm. Um, so there's, there's tons still, you know, still a lot more capacity on the way labor, as we know, is hitting every single industry, uh, manufacturing distribution, um, our industries, you know, every industry is being hit with labor challenges. Um, and then of course you add a little bit of COVID to that and you add some closures and you add some government regulations, you add some taxes and tariffs. Um, it creates the perfect storm of, you know, this is why we are where we are. Well, I'll say that not too very long ago, a few years back, there was a lot of de decommissioning of a lot of the ocean freight, ocean capacity, and it's going to take a while to build that back up if it ever does. I mean, if they can get everybody to pay this astronomical rate for uh, ocean shipping, why would they build a lot more to make it half that? Um, and part of the part of that's going to be driven by the fact that some of the things that we have been buying in other places just doesn't make the normal model work. I mean, the idea that we're taking high cube heavy stuff and producing it in China and bringing it over here at low transportation costs, it's not that big a deal. But you multiply that by 5x and it absolutely doesn't make deal make a make sense and so the near shoring does become more um of a possibility just from an economic standpoint so mm -hmm. some of these things are kind of natural changes that are going to happen but they just don't happen quickly you don't suddenly just change your whole supply supply chain you don't suddenly build bigger faster ships you don't you know all those things um, 
so we've got, we've got I'm just, go ahead Ian. no i was gonna i was gonna address the uh, question in the electrical industry um so someone has asked uh how will the current inflation correction uh affect the electrical industry so I thought I, if you guys have something to share, you can, you obviously can. I thought I'd, I got a couple of ideas myself, you know, so I think uh, I would broaden it to say it's not just the electrical industry, it's anybody involved in construction, right? So mm -hmm. the, 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 um, it's getting really hard to do pricing on projects because uh, you can't rely on what the price is going to be. You also don't know when you're going to get the product. Uh, and so the whole quoting uh, you know, bid submittal process has gotten very, very difficult, whether you're in electrical construction, concrete construction, plumbing, heating, you know, underground, it's all, it's all very difficult right now because of product shortages and inflation. You know, I think um, everybody is throwing around the word force majeure more than I've ever heard it in my mm -hmm. life, because, you know, the, it, it's it's either the way you defend yourself or, you know, yeah, or it's, it's the way you kind of get out of some of these commitments. I think, um, you know, we talked to the CEO of a steel, big steel services center and, you know, they they can, their suppliers can just pretty much charge whatever they want. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. and they, and they have to pay it. So I think, you know, what we're hearing is the, the democratizing nature of this is sort of the, Good, only silver lining, which is that everybody's in the same boat, right? It's not like if you're an electrical distributor uh, and you're struggling with, you know, price increases that are unpredictable and unpredictable deliveries and product shortages that you have a competitor across town who's not struggling with that. I mean, Fastenal is kind of this unique case because their business model is so different. But if you're an electrical distributor, everybody you compete with is facing the same thing. So it's really about... Um, making sure that you're a better operator within a the same lousy macro environment everybody else is operating in. That means, you know, a couple of things, make sure you're managing your price increases and getting through your system quickly. Make sure that you are very, very aggressively and proactively on the phone with your suppliers all the time, getting the latest information that you are similarly communicating uh, internally. And, you know, the, you know, I know an electrical distributor and they are constantly sharing communication from, some, from supplier to customer. It's just this structurally built in thing now where they, they are on the phone all the time with their major manufacturers. They're getting updates, they're, they're communicating to their customers. And so that even though they're not able to outperform their competitors in terms of delivery and, and price increases, they are providing much better uh, customer experience uh, and, and communication so that the people downstream hear from them first and hear the most accurate information. And, you know, suppliers know that they're going to have to provide this information on a regular basis. So I think a lot of it is just recognizing, look, it's a terrible macro environment for everybody, outperform. Uh, and, uh, and, and if you establish that very strong communication, you will be in a better position to understand as things improve and, and face less risk and way overshooting and having way too much inventory on hand. I, I, think, that's, I, I think that's a, a good thing to talk about because if your costs go up, I mean, the first question would be, can we pass it down to, and, and, and increase our prices? Well, that doesn't work very long. If somebody else that you're competing with figures out a way to do it better, um, I think it's going to force people to think differently about how, what are the products they sell. I mean, if your costs go up and your margins go down at some point in time, you're going in the red and you're going to have to just change pretend, potentially the mix of things you're selling, um, which really ends up being an opportunity for the uh, the people at the bottom that can fit, that are very efficient that can make things with low margins, even if the costs go up. So it's a, it's a whole business model change. I think part of, um, in particular to the electrical industry is you made a bid last year based on prices for copper. You're awarded the bid now and you now have to fill it. I mean, that's, that's really the, the conundrum that is very painful for a, a bid style business is a lag between award and delivery of the bid versus when the bid was made. Yeah. And, but that's where force majeure comes in. Right. And, right. and yeah, you know, and, and everybody's facing the same thing. So, yeah, I mean, I guess you probably should make sure your contracts are addressing this if yeah. they aren't already or your bids. Right. Yeah. Ian, you mentioned a really good thing. So I think one of the ways to resolve the issue is a collaboration. And oftentimes it's always been a vacuum, right? The distributor only shares so much information with the end customer. 
manufacturer only share so much with the distributor. Um, what I'm seeing right now is a lot of the manufacturers are saying, okay, we know we're going to have demand. Who's going to buy the demand? Um, one of the suppliers, Alan Bradley, whom I'm sure many of you have heard of, they, they are talking to the big buyers of their products and saying, what is your forecast for the next 18 to 24 months? Um, and then they are coming to us and saying, hey, guys, what is your forecast? And then we're going to our customers saying, hey, what, what are you thinking? So I think that collaboration is going to be really essential to trying to resolve some of these things. Um, and to your point, Jonathan, you know, bidding something a year ago and having it come through now, um, we are getting quotes from our suppliers, you know, whether it's a racking company or conveyor company, they're giving us five days before that's no longer valid. So, oh. so we have to have an open relationship with our clients and say, Hey guys, we're going to have this rebid on Monday and you got to execute by Thursday, hmm. <laughs> you know? Um, so it's, it's been an evolving process. So we, we've had to rebid multiple projects, um, basically every 30 days. Hmm. So it's, it's not too hard to do because they just give you, you know, they add 20% to it and you just go from there. Um, but, but it is a stress, but I think as long as you communicate with your client base and that collaboration across all channels or across all parts of that supply chain, I think it has to be one of the three pillars to get us back to normal. Um, you know, in my opinion, uh, and I think the second pillar, which might probably is the most primary pillar is the nearshoring approach. Um, I, I think we have too many weak links. It's too global. It's too hard to respond to demand, uh, across the lengths that we are today. Uh, so I think that's the second pillar. Now, the third, we can all debate. <laughs> well, I would add to that, and I can't remember who talked about it. Uh, I, I think you did, Helgi, about, about lean, and everybody kind of trashed the, uh, the term as yeah. something that's making all the problems be more painful. Um, but if you think about what the long-term issue is, what the long-term solution is, that's got to still be part of it. Yes. And if you do it, if you do it in the true fashion that you should, you're going to come to the conclusions of near near shore versus an eight week pipeline that has no flexibility in it. Um, so I think there will be some natural um, evolution in those things, but I I don't I don't think the anti lean approach is going to work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I wasn't suggesting that, Bruce. It was yeah, just I, I know that you were, but, <laughs> but you're saying people people are because. Uh, I, I worked a lot in just in time uh, many years ago, and that was kind of the thing that people would throw grenades into is, yeah, just in time. But what if what if we have a big ice storm in the northeast? We can't build cars. Yeah. Right. But if it's too costly, you can't build them either. So. Yeah. Um, Jonathan, you want to jump into some more questions here? You bet. Um, so we have a this is a really good question. How? By the way, all these have been gold medal winners. So we really appreciate the, the, the thoughts here. How can we as a smaller business contend with the forward buying power of some of these monolithic companies like Walmart or Amazon? I'll, I'll yeah. bet there's at least, I'll bet there's more than one of you that are experiencing this right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, Jonathan, I'll address that first. I'll let Bruce and Ian and you add some more, more context to it. The, uh, we've had this question about the Amazon effect for years, right? and uh, or the Walmart effect, whatever you want to term it, but it's basically been termed the Amazon effect. And Amazon is a big behemoth, as we all know, um, but they've made everyone better, in my opinion. Uh, and I think the big difference that a smaller distributor has over an Amazon is the service side. You have most likely technicians that know the product. Amazon, they don't know anything, right? It's just there for sale, you buy it and you figure it out. A, a provider of service, like a smaller distributor, uh, they're going to have the technical knowledge, they're going to have the technical expertise, they're going to be able to provide recommendations, they're going to be able to help their end customer do things the right way. And I think that's really the differentiator that a small distributor has to focus on. Um, now, again, buying, if, you know, if, if, uh, if the price is 10, you know, 10x difference, then it might be a, 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 you know, something to debate. But I think fundamentally speaking, smaller distributors, their, their value proposition is service, caring about their customer, caring about the customer's results. And, and I don't find that Amazon is built that way. It's a, it's a different build. But Helgi, I think the, the, the part of this question is, yeah. so that's how you compete. But yeah. this, this question is, how do you get product? I mean, is, is, is that right. having better service going to allow you to get product when these guys are buying, you know, long shipfuls of things? Or how, how do you handle yeah. that? Yeah, no, I think it comes down to that collaboration piece that Ian mentioned earlier. Is as a small distributor, you have X number of manufacturers that you're buying from. Uh, and is having those open conversations. Hey, guys, we have to fulfill this demand. Uh, this is required from you. And having that open conversation, I think, is the only way. 
I mean, we all know in the real world, uh, sometimes the big guy wins just because they have more leverage. Uh, they have more financial leverage. But I think there's ways to try to mitigate it to a point that makes it, you know, where it's not as um, obviously bad for you as it could be. Um, so, so I think if that distributor goes to the manufacturer that it buys from and has an open conversation and says, hey, we're expecting this demand, we need your commitment to help support that. Um, now, the price point, obviously, Amazon can, you know, do things differently than others. But, um, but, but I think that's definitely a negotiating and a, a collaborative approach that would make things better. Uh, and and I, would like, I would like to jump in with one point because having worked in several companies and then consulted for others that, you know, were seen as an alternate channel to, you know, big boxes, for example, um, a lot of these manufacturers already have a lot of customer concentration with, you know, Home Depot, Walmart, Amazon, et cetera. Um, and they want to keep these other channels healthy. So, uh, as much pressure as those big players are going to put on those manufacturers in the long run, if that results in these other channels losing even more channel share and it increases the customer concentration problem with, you know, manufacturers that sell through multiple channels, that's a long-term problem for those manufacturers. So I think you, you are disadvantaged. There's no question about it, but they have an interest in making sure that you remain a, a viable alternative uh, for, you know, some strategic reasons of their own. Yeah. Fair point. Um, so we, we have a question, uh, uh, whether tariff or shipping cost induced prices are artificially increased and inventory valuations are too, how are different companies accounting for these variances throughout the year, uh, particularly according to gap requirements. So that's really outside the scope of our expertise. I think, uh, you know, I did find, um, uh, there's an article on, uh, PwC, uh, pricewaterhousecoopers.com called COVID-19 impact on accounting and valuation for impairments. Um, and so I don't know if you guys have anything to add to that. I, I don't, I have ran across the articles because somebody else asked me about this, but I, you know, I would say if you go to PwC and do COVID-19 impact on accounting uh, or you know, the other public accounting places, they, they're probably better sources. I don't think any of us here are CPAs. Uh, do you guys have anything to add to that or would you? No, no I would agree. I'd agree with you, Ian. All right. Um, I think we have maybe time for one more question, Jonathan. Does that? Yep. We should have a comment, which is uh, in response to how do we deal with the forward buying of the big players. Uh, one way that we can get our share of the manufacturer's capacity is by placing blanket orders that put us in the manufacturing queue with the vendor. We've done that with one of our major filtration vendors. Yeah, that's good insight. Um, without mentioning names, I happen to know this is a very smart CEO operator. So. Yeah, and I, and I think, Jonathan, that hits on Ian's point earlier, which is, uh, and, and as I shared earlier as well, a lot of our partners are buying ahead of time. They're putting those blanket purchase orders like the Alan Bradley question that I shared. Um, and my concern, and I think Ian's concern as he shared earlier, is in two years, let's say, we're going to have a lot of distributors with a lot of excess inventory, uh, which will then probably go at a fire sale. Um, so I think there's a very, there's a caution, cautionary tale in there somewhere. Um, about you definitely want to buy ahead to, to make sure you have availability of your product and that you can compete financially. Um, but there's also that concern about we may have so much inventory that, it, you know, as you said, it can kill your turns, it kills your financials. Um, but I don't know what the exact answer is. I don't think anyone knows the exact answer. It's trying to predict the future. Um, and that's obviously an impossible task. But I'm going to ask you anyway, because that's how we're going to wrap. That's the question we're going to wrap up on. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to predict the future. When do you see in, and we're not going to hold you accountable for this, you know, but, you know, we're going to ask you, when do you start seeing this begin to resolve? I will jump first. And I'll let Bruce add his. My answer to that, Ian, is 18 to 24 months. Okay. Uh, and it's based on some factors. It's based on some of our manufacturers talking about some of their raw materials. Um, it's about that Alan Bradley question I mentioned earlier that they're saying what well, used to be eight weeks is now 36 weeks. Uh, and I think all those things compound upon themselves. Um, I think, I personally think we're probably past the COVID issues, I hope. Um, so I think that'll be less of a concern. Um, the, the labor market to me is still a big one. Uh, as I shared earlier, the client I met with, they've already increased their wages twice this year. And they're talking about a third time because Walmart's bringing a DC in the area. And, and they're at 70% capacity. They, they need 100 people to run their building. They only have 70 because they can't get the other 30 there. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot of, you know, pressures. I think the big pressure of, Hey, we can't get product, uh, like this Christmas, a lot of children will be disappointed. 
Um, but I think within the next 18 to 24 months, it'll start to, to normalize. Um, and that's again, you know, assuming there was no war or right. change in governments or something, you know, uh, that we can't control right now, supply chain wise. Right. Yeah, I would probably say um, I might be a little more optimistic, um, but it kind of depends on how everybody's reacting to this. Um, certainly this peak season retail is going to be a very telling thing to us, finding out just how much we didn't have that we wanted or how much more did we have to pay than we wish to or you know whatever the challenges are. I think the changes that are happening um, are, are here to stay. I mean, the idea of e-commerce suddenly being at 2025 levels of where we thought they would be um, a year and a half ago. Um, the whole thing of that we're changing the way we're thinking about product demand and how we're gonna serve it. Um, hopefully people are really taking this seriously that we're not gonna return to where we were and making the changes. So I think the question that was asked about the little guy who doesn't have the same buying power, um, those things aren't, uh, you know, how, how well are you going to be able to get better? How well are you going to be able to differentiate yourself with customer service or whatever it is? But anyway, I'm hopeful that we learn our lessons fairly quickly and the stability starts returning by mid-year next year. And I have no economic background to forecast that i'm just seeing what's going on and how fast people are changing right now it doesn't matter bruce because you'll find economists uh, at, er, at every stage <laughs> yeah, of the, of the... <laughs> yeah. jonathan do you have any uh, any opinion um I, I actually don't have an opinion on this i, I think it's I, I, I think it's really hard to predict this one yeah right i mean because I, I think like the people who are making predictions about demand once we got into COVID, I think they were really out over their skis on a lot of this stuff. And so, you know, the, the normal approaches you have for predicting this stuff are just out the window. Yeah. So I, I think that's probably right. I, I, you know, based on what I've heard, I think you might start to see things improve a little bit third quarter of next year. Uh, but it is probably 18 months before there's, you know, noticeable improvement. But, you know, I'm, you know, I'm just speculating based on what I've heard various people say. So uh, let's tell everybody how they can uh, get a hold of uh, our guest today if they would like to and talk about a couple of upcoming events. The contact information is on the right. There's an uh, email address and a, a phone number, or if you uh, would like us to put you in touch with them, please reach out. We'll be happy to do that. Uh, my contact information and Jonathan's is on the left. We do have a couple of upcoming events. There's a uh, Telephone-based sales reps, a whole new sales channel. This is not inbound. This is outbound sales reps who work over the phone on October 20th. It's brought to you by Optimizely and Proton.ai. And then uh, on October 27th, we have an encore performance of a popular webinar uh, that we've actually added some new information to called Getting the Most from Cloud ERP, New Capabilities and a Strong ROI. We have world-class consultants who are doing those uh, webinars for us. Uh, but they are both sponsored so that we can afford to hire those world-class consultants. And Epicor is the uh, sponsor of the one on October 27th. So we hope you'll join us then. Helgi, Bruce, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Enjoyed talking to you a lot. It was a great discussion. Uh, Jonathan, is great working with you again. Um, I hope uh, everyone on the call uh, learned something. Please let us know if we can help you. Have a great uh, week or two until we talk to you again and reach out to any of us if we can help you. Thanks for joining us today on the Wholesale Change Show. Bye, everybody.